right, so thank you all for coming. Our first invited speaker for today is Andrew Subi, who is a professor of numerical analysis in the Mathematical Institute of the University of Oxford, fellow and tutor in mathematics at Worcester College, and supernumerary fellow at Linacre College, both in Oxford. He was educated in the universities of Belgrade, Reading, and St. Catherine's College in Oxford. And among other words and distinctions that he has, he's elected president of the Siam for the UK, yeah, so the Republic of Ireland for this year. His research is mainly on mathematical and numerical analysis of nonlinear PDs and finite elements. And today he's going to talk about analysis and approximations of Nadler Stokes pocket flying systems. Thank you very much for coming. Um, the subject of this talk uh, is basically the solution of a long-standing problem in polymer chemistry, which uh, has to do with uh, the existence of global weak solutions and that is those focal flank systems. Um, so that's going to be sort of the first two-thirds of the talk. In the final part of the talk, I will be talking what I'm supposed to be talking about. This session is about numerical analysis, so I will be talking about computational issues. Uh, but I, I think sort of the crux of the talk will be, first of all, the description of the model, which you will see throughout the talk in front of you on the board. And your first impression, I hope, when you look at this, will be the same as mine. It's an absolutely dis disgusting set of partial differential equations. So if you were here yesterday at James's uh, talk, you will have seen the Navier-Stokes equations. The only difference here between what James wrote down yesterday is that you have a function rho here. Rho is the density, which satisfies one of the fundamental uh, partial differential equations of continuum mechanics, which is conservation of mass. So this is this partial differential equation. Rho is a function of time, so this is a partial derivative in t. This is a divergence of u. u is a velocity field times rho is equal to zero. You have an initial condition. There's no boundary condition on rho in this case because it is assumed that u is equal to zero on the boundary. So the boundary of the domain is a characteristic boundary. So u here satisfies uh, what is known as the conservation of momentum, basically the in incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, rho u partial with respect to t, and you see the other terms. Um, so this is rho u dyadic product with u, uh, whose divergence you take. Uh, James yesterday wrote this as u dot grad u, uh, rho was constant. Um, yesterday, uh, in James's talk, uh, viscosity was constant. Today, mu uh, is a uh, function of rho, the density. You have the gradient of the pressure in the fluid, rho times F, F is an external source. And you have some extra stuff here on the right hand side, which is really the crux of this talk, and I shall talk about that in a second. This talk is given by a formula, which was written down by Hans Kramers. This is the same Kramers as the K in WKB theory. So it's a Dutch uh, uh, statistical physicist who uh, wrote down a formula for this tor. I'll explain this in a second. Tor uh, depends on a function psi. Psi is a probability density function. Um, psi tilde is a renormalized version of this probability density function where psi is divided by something called the max -valian, which I shall talk about later, and z is drag in the fluid, which is a function of rho, and this uh, renormalized probability density function satisfies what is known as this uh, Fokker-Planck equation here. So uh, the max -valian m, this is a concept that comes from statistical physics, uh, is defined by this formula down here. So m of q is a product of partial max -valians, and each of these partial max -valians is uh, given by this. So this is the problem that we are looking at. And uh, so the question is, does this set of equation have a solution? OK, um, so why might you be interested in anything like this? <laughs> Uh, again, going back to James's talk yesterday, if you think about standard uh, fluids such as uh, water, for example, here if I take this bottle of water and I shake it, the motion of fluid, motion of water in this bottle will be described by the incompressible Debian Stokes equations. And if you imagine that the density of the uh, fluid, in this case water, is constant, you can set rho equal to a constant. Um, this term will not be there, the fluid will be incompressible, you will have an initial condition, and this is a closed container, the velocity on the boundary is equal to zero, so that's your boundary condition. So, well, what else is there? I hope you can see this. 
uh, not very big. I couldn't take a larger toothpaste into the plane while I was coming here. So, for example, when you brush your teeth uh, this morning, let me turn it this way so I don't advertise. Uh, so if this, were, if this was water inside this and I shook it, and water would come out of this thing. And believe me, this is full. This is not empty. So what's in here is an example of a non-standard fluid, what is known as a non-Newtonian fluid, which is not described by the Navier-Stokes equations. You need some extra terms in the Navier-Stokes equations in order to describe the motion of such, well, weird fluids. Uh, other examples of non-Newtonian fluids are, for example, paints, uh, custard, mustard, ketchup, all sorts of gels in cosmetics and so on. So there are loads of examples of non-Newtonian fluids. So this particular model here is concerned with what are known as dilute polymers. These equations were written down by Kramer specifically to model the motions of dilute polymers. But let me just give you a few examples of non-Newtonian fluids. So this is an experiment here that you see on the left. It's called the rock climbing uh, experiment. You stick your pencil into a non-Newtonian fluid and you rotate your pencil. And the sort of thing that you see is not something that will happen with water. Water would not climb up your pencil. And here you can see this uh, uh, fluid climbing up the pencil. This rotating uh, rod. Here is another fluid which lies between two plates. And these two plates are slowly pulled apart. And when the plates are pulled apart sufficiently, you see this uh, elastic uh, vibrating motion of that the fluid exhibits. So indeed, this term that is added to the Navier-Stokes equation is what is called the elastic extra stress tensor, uh, whose role is specifically to, to describe these elastic effects that are exhibited by non-Newtonian fluids. So for example, this uh, gel-like behavior. So it arises simply from the decomposition of the Cauchy stress tensor. So uh, this is the deviatoric part of the Cauchy stress tensor that you see in, in, this, in this term. Then uh, the volumetric part is in the pressure. And what's here, this divergence tau is a third part in the Cauchy uh, stress tensor. This is uh, what is known the elastic extra stress. And as I said, this is not there in the Navier-Stokes equation. Simply, tau is simply zero. Now, there are various models to describe what tor is, and what I'm talking about is just one model in a whole zoo of various models, which uh, one might think in order to define tor, depending on the fluid. Okay, so these are the equations that I'm interested in. So the first part of the talk is concerned simply uh, by trying to explain to you where these crazy equations come from. So what will be on the slides will be largely repetitions of what's on the board, but just to have the equations in front of you throughout the talk, I wrote them down on the board. So on the first slide, you see conservation of mass, so basically this set of equations, and then you see conservation of momentum. Uh, currently without this tor term, these are the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations for, the variable, for a variable density fluid. Uh, and then you add this uh, so-called elastic extra stress, to the Navier-Stokes equation, the question is how do you define this tor? Well, I already defined it, so let me try to explain to you where all this stuff comes from. So here's Kramer, Hans Kramer, who first wrote down this formula for this tau in the company of George Uhlenbeck. So this is the, the same Uhlenbeck as in, if you did a course on, on stochastic processes, Ornstein Uhlenbeck process, and Samuel Goudsmith is the person responsible for the idea of electron spin. So both of, so all three uh, of these guys are very famous. So it is Hans Kramer's in the middle uh, that is responsible for this model. And so the idea is the following. So these dilute polymers, probably the simplest way to think about them is you think about a soup. And in this soup, you have long polymer molecules which are flowing in the soup just as spaghetti is moving in a soup. So if you think about a spaghetti, uh, so this would be a long polymer molecule in these models, uh, the fact that this is an elastic uh, object, which is in, in your polymer, is described by a succession of beads which are connected with elastic springs. So Ri is the location of the i bead uh, with respect to some coordinate system that you choose, and QI is the orientation vector of uh, the, whatever this is, I, I guess it would be the i beat. So this is the QI, is the difference of the position vectors 
Ri plus 1 minus Ri is 2i. So if you just remember this notation Ri because, uh, and 2i because this will be relevant later on. K is typically a large number and this will have consequences later on when we look at the numerics of these equations because it will turn out that this Fokker-Planck equation uh, which looks superficially as a nice parabolic partial differential equation from uh, the, the numerical point of view is absolutely nasty because uh, the spatial dimension is precisely the number k here that you see. So if k is large, this will be a very, very high dimensional parabolic partial differential equation. So we're not talking about solving PDs in two or three dimensions. You might be solving PDs in 30, 40, I don't know, 100 dimensions. Okay. So uh, just to try to explain where the Fokker-Planck equation comes from, if you think about uh, trying to describe the motion, for example, of the ith bead in this configuration, the idea would be that you write down, roughly speaking, Newton's second law. So force is equal to mass times acceleration. Except in these models, which come from statistical physics, the idea is that there's an element of randomness in uh, this setup because uh, the molecules of the surrounding fluid, the soup in which the spaghetti lies, are in a random fashion bombarding the ith uh, molecule. So it's really not, uh, uh, strictly speaking, Newton's second law you are talking about, but some kind of randomized version of it, which is uh, uh, what is going to lead to large advanced equation that you see here uh, in front of you. I'll come to that in a second. So um, what you see on the left-hand side is force. And what you see on the right-hand side is mass times acceleration, except in this model it is assumed that mass is so small that you can neglect it, so this is why you have the zero on the right-hand side. So mass is said to be zero. And what you have on the, right -hand si the left-hand side is the sum of forces that act on the ith bead. So what are the forces that act on the ith bead? Well, the first one is what is called hydrodynamic drag, which is used due to the fact that uh, these, these beads are in a moving fluid. So there, there is a some kind of friction that is acting on the beads, which are assumed to be uh, little balls. And uh, Stokes' uh, law for viscous drag is the drag coefficient, actually minus the drag coefficient times the velocity. Uh, and velocity here is ve velocity relative to the moving fluid, whose velocity is u. So this is why the u is subtracted here. The whole thing is written not as a differential equation in the normal sense, but rather as a stochastic differential equation because the third force here will be a random force. So this is the way you write stochastic differential equation. But before I get to that, so the second force is an elastic force, which you have to define somehow uh, because these are supposed to be elastic springs. And the way this is defined is you choose yourself some kind of spring potential. So it's kind of part of the model. You have to say what your spring potential is. Is this a Hookean spring or is it some kind of nonlinear spring and so on? So um, that spring potential for the ith spring is this ui that you see here in, in, in the definition of the nuts. So this is this intramolecular force, uh, which is uh, an elastic force. And then finally, you have uh, some kind of Brownian noise, which is uh, due to the fact, as I said, uh, that uh, the surrounding fluid bombards the ith bead. Uh, so Kb is the, the Boltzmann constant, T is the temperature, and uh, zeta here is once again the drag coefficient. And dW uh, is uh, uh, Wi is a, a linear process of Brownian noise. Good, okay. Uh, so one possibility to solve uh, these equations would be to apply techniques from uh, numerics of stochastic differential equations and simply go away and try to solve these equations. So that would be one possibility. Uh, another option would be to try to think about not uh, specifically tracing uh, the motion of the ith bead, which you would be doing if you were to solve this stochastic dif differential equation, but instead look at a uh, slightly more macroscopic quantity. For example, a, a probability density function that is associated uh, with uh, the random variable Ri, uh, because R now is random. So, uh, the unknown here is the location of the i to be the position vector i i which is what you're looking for so alternatively you might be looking for a probability density function associated with this okay. to, in order to get to that point uh, let me just rewrite these stochastic differential equations in a slightly more uh, tractable form so zeta as i said is a characteristic uh, uh, 
uh, drag uh, coefficient in the fluid. And as you have seen on this uh, picture here, the way this polymer molecule is configured is that each ball has a left neighbor and a right neighbor. So that need not be the case. You can think of more complicated networks of polymer molecules, but in this particular case, this is uh, what it is, the setup. So this is where this matrix com comes from. So the leftmost guy uh, has only one neighbor. Uh, each of the other polymer molecules have a left neighbor and the right neighbor and so on. And then the last one has only one neighbor from the other side. So these GIJs are plus or minus one, depending on the connectivity. So GIJ is one, is spring J starts from bead I, and is minus one if spring J terminates at BI, and it's zero otherwise. Okay, so this is just a piece of notation uh, which I'm introducing in order to, uh, actually to already appears here, but it's also going to appear on the next slide. So I take these stochastic differential equations and think about now collecting the position vectors of each of the beads, bead number one, bead number two, and so on. These are the i's, there's k plus one beads. You dump all these uh, r's into a single vector. This is some kind of random vector. And then w is a vector of a Wiener processes acting on uh, the individual components. There's k plus one of those, there's some kind of constant. A b is a vector function which I just define, and then uh, that stochastic differential equation that you saw on the previous slide can be rewritten as uh, something more like something that you, we are used to. So bz, z being this vector, b is this here, and then you have sigma, sigma is this constant, bw, w is this vector here. Okay. So one possibility might be that you solve this stochastic differential equation in order to trace the positions of, of your an alternative is the following. There is a result, this is a famous result due to Kolmogorov, which uh, says the following in essence. So if you think about, instead of this uh, random variable, vectorial random variable, you think about the probability density function of this uh, random variable, then it turns out that the probability density function of this random variable satisfies a partial differential equation, completely deterministic. So once again, you have the stochastic differential equations on the previous slide. If instead of the stochastic ordering differential equations, you think about the probability density function of this random variable that solves the stochastic differential equation, then this uh, function, this probability density function, satisfies a parabolic equation. That's this. So the psi, which uh, appears later on in this Fokker Planck equation, is precisely the psi that comes from this formula. So take this theorem and you apply it to this stochastic differential equation, and what comes out of it is what you see here, uh, this uh, partial differential equation, which is uh, what is known as Fokker-Planck. So this is your Fokker-Planck equation. The only thing that has happened, so previously the variables were uh, these r i's, the position vectors, a change of variables was also performed, so I didn't write down the details, a change of variables was performed, so instead of working with the coordinates, which are the position vectors of the beads, there's a linear change of variables. Uh, instead of using k plus one position vectors, I'm using the center of mass of the configuration, which is this number here, and the orientation vectors. You remember these qi's, q1, q2, the directions of the beads, uh, and there's k, k of those, so all together I have uh, k plus one, independent variables, and in terms of those variables, the Fokker-Planck equation looks like this. Now, okay, so if you compare that with what's on the board, you will notice that it's not quite, this is not quite what is on the board here. Uh, and the reason for that is the following. So if you look at the, the, uh, these equations carefully for a moment, you see that there are two terms in the equation, this blue term there and this other blue term, which kind of look similar. There's a one over four lambda there, and there's a one over four lambda there, um, there's a psi over zeta, there's a psi over zeta, and things like this. So the idea is to somehow pull these two terms together. So instead of having two terms, you pull them together, and the trick for doing that is you introduce what is known as the Maxwellian. Well, simply said, stated, this Maxwellian is nothing else but an integrating factor, really. So basically, if you multiply this whole equation, but by this magic Maxwellian, 
acts as an integrating factor. You can pull these two guys together into a single term, and this is where this uh, partial di differential equation, Fokker Planck equation here, as stated on the board, comes from. Except instead of psi, you see this psi over zeta, and there's a Maxwellian coming in. I define psi tilde, which is psi over zeta and the Maxwellian, and so that is the final form for the Planck equation. So, I mean, the purpose of all this. Uh, Song and Darcy is to massage the equations into a form which is amenable to analysis. Because this is not particularly nice as it is. Well, it's not particularly nice in that form either, for that matter. But anyway. Okay, so there are some physical quantities here. So epsilon is what is known as the central mass uh, dissipation, central mass uh, diffusion coefficient. Lambda is a constant, and uh, this is called the Deborah number. F here. Uh, is the derivative of ui, u is the spring potential which you choose for the i spring. So this is part of the model. You have to say what your u is. Uh, then you have a spring force which is ui dash times qi, and this matrix A is a symmetric positive definite matrix which is in polymer chemistry uh, known as the uh, Rouse matrix. So it's G, remember this bidiagonal G matrix, G transpose G uh, gives you the A. Okay, so that is the model. So then, if you somehow manage to solve this equation, imagine that uh, somebody gave you the velocity field u. So somebody, so God-given velocity field u there, you could go away and solve this partial differential equation. Actually, it's a linear parabolic equation, so it doesn't look so bad. So if you had this uh, psi here, then given psi, you would work out this psi tilde, which is psi divided by the Maxwellian uh, over the drag coefficient, which is also known given the fluid. Okay. Or you could just take your psi and you plug it into this formula and work this out, and this will give you tau. And then you take your tau and you shove it into the right-hand side of your Navier-Stokes equation, and then you solve that. The snag is that u is not given. And u is the solution of the Navier-Stokes equation. So the u that appears here actually depends on whatever tau is, and tau depends on psi, and psi depends on u, so the whole thing is fully coupled. Okay, so this is the situation. Is that okay? <laughs> Can you follow this? <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> okay, but please interrupt me if you have any questions. It really is a nightmare to describe. Okay, so this uh, mi is uh, this i partial Maxwellian. Maxwellian is this Maxwellian is the product of the partial Maxwellians. So you have these direction vectors for the springs, and there's k of those, and for each of them you have this Maxwellian defined by this formula. And uh, so the product of those is the Maxwellian. So one uh, additional piece of notation: this di that you see here is a ball in uh, two or three dimensions. So let's suppose we are in 3D. Uh, so this di is the set of all possible orientation vectors for the i spring. So if you think about the i spring, it can point this way or that way or that way. So it could point in all possible directions. And then you might have some kind of limitation on the magnitude uh, uh, to which, uh, well, the, the length, the maximum length to which the spring could stretch. So it, could take various orientations, but the, the stretching is limited. So what limits the stretching is this number bi, which you also need to specify. To what extent are these polymer molecules allowed to stretch? So that is part of the model. If, for example, you chose bi to be plus infinity, that would mean that you could stretch the, the polymer molecules out to infinity, which is not particularly realistic uh, physically. But you do see models like that, actually, in the polymer chemistry literature, where this b is set to infinity. So let me just give you two examples uh, of these uh, spring potentials and thereby the, the corresponding Maxwellians. So also the simplest possible and most stupid one to choose is precisely the one that I mentioned, is to think of Hookean springs. So Hookean springs are linear springs, so you would allow stretching out to infinity. And in that case, you would have a linear spring, so u of s is maybe some spring constant times s. So up to a constant, it's a linear function. So then u dash. Uh, is uh, u dash is equal to 1, uh, for example, and uh, e to the minus uh, u, which is what appears in the calculation for the Maxwellian, is basically e to the minus 1 half q squared, and then you normalize that. Let me just go back to the formula for the 
much value. So we have worked out the numerator, and then you normalize it by a constant factor in order to ensure that the integral of the max value is precisely one. So this is just a constant at the bottom to ensure that the integral uh, of this i max value is uh, equal to one. But after a constant, it's an exponential function, so it's like a Gaussian. So that's one possibility, and uh, as I said, that's sort of a stupid one because that would allow polymer molecules to stretch out infinitely. Alternatively, what you could do, and this is really quite frequently done in the polymer chemistry literature, is to assume that D is a bounded ball. So this limits the stretching, the amount of stretching that you might allow, and the uh, potential that is uh, frequently used in the polymer chemistry literature is this one here. It's called a finitely extensible nonlinear elastic uh, potential. So u of s is this logarithmic function. In this case, u dash is, you just differentiate this, 1 minus 2s over p to the minus 1. You can also work out the max value, and e to the minus u, whatever u is, is this function, 1 minus q squared over b, b over 2. So what you see here is when q squared hits b, and this is precisely the boundary of the ball, when q squared is equal to b, you have b over b, so that's 1, 1 minus 1 is equal to 0. So this m is a positive function, and on the boundary of a certain board that you have chosen, it is equal to zero. Now, from the PD point of view, this will have repercussions because uh, this M appears in this partial differential equation. So basically, on the boundary of your uh, D domain, and this D domain is the Cartesian product of these various uh, DI domains, these are the various balls in which these stretching vectors can lie, high dimensional domain, so this M will be equal to zero on the boundary of this domain. So this parabolic equation will degenerate on the boundary so that's not nice. Okay, so here's just a cross-section of the max value. And in the case that uh, you, you, you just have two balls connected with a single spring, so there's just one max value because there's just one spring, two balls, this is what the cross-section looks like. So you see that uh, it is equal to zero on the boundary. Otherwise, if you rotate it around, it would look like a sombrero. It drops down to zero on the boundary. Okay. So here's finally the fokker planck equation in precisely the form that you see on the board. And here's the Kramer's expression written down in 1944 by Kramer's. And as I said, well, the question is, great, fantastic, does this have a solution? Well, polymer chemists didn't seem to be too bothered. They've been happily solving these equations uh, in one form or another since the 1940s, co computationally or otherwise. But, you know, honestly, just as with the Navier-Stokes equations, I think it is uh, crucial to know whether these equations are, uh, do, whether they do have a solution. And in particular, from the computational point of view, what are you solving if you do not know that the equations are solved? So before I launch into any kind of numerical analysis, I would really like to know whether the equations that I'm solving are meaningful in any sense. So I'm moving on to the second part. So how do we go about showing that these equations have a solution? There's been a considerable amount of work. The first piece of uh, effort I'm aware of is a paper by Michael Rinaldi in 1991, uh, Science Journal of Mathematical Analysis, where he managed to show the existence of smooth solutions for a short time. So starting from very, very smooth um, initial conditions, he managed to show that for a short time, these equations have the solution in the case of precisely this Phoebe model that I described to you. And there's a long list of other you see some very prominent people here. You see Priya, Louis Lyons, Massimo, Peter Constantin, and so on. Um, we ourselves, so, so by we I mean John Barrett, Christoph Sharp, and I, uh, and John Barrett and I subsequently, John Barrett is at the Imperial College in London, wrote a succession of papers where we tried to show the existence of global in time weak solutions to these equations. The first uh, uh, of these papers is this one here in 2005 uh, was basically well the only way we could get the argument through is uh, to modify certain terms in the equation just as uh, this is sometimes done for the Navier Stokes equations and this wasn't the way actually even though this is a fairly highly cited paper this is not the way to go and it took us I guess five years to figure out how to go about this. 
And I, I suppose had we known more about statistical physics, had we taken a course on statistical physics, which we didn't, we would have probably not spent five years trying to understand what is the essence of these equations. But I think it is not until you understand what is behind the derivation of the equations is when it finally takes place. Uh, so these results are published in a succession of basically three papers. Each of them are 70, 80 page long papers. So these are very long, uh, fairly tedious calculations to show that the equations have uh, a weak solution in various forms. And then there's this paper by, uh, with Bulicek and Malik that I wrote where we consider more complicated nonlinearities in this term, but I shall not talk about that. So let me just, in order to get to this theoretical result, I shan't be able to prove it, just, but just to give you an idea how this uh, is proved, uh, namely the existence of global weak solutions to this set of equations, the way we do this is as follows. So here are the assumptions. So suppose that you are on a Lipschitz domain. This is the flow domain for the fluid. You take some initial velocity u0, which you assume to be divergence-free. You take some external force, uh, you assume that it's square root of in time, and it has some integrability in space. Uh, this integrability power is greater than 1 in 2D, or 6, 5, or bigger in 3D. The initial density is supposed to be positive and bounded above between rho min and rho max. Uh, this Rouse matrix that you see in the Fokker Planck equation is positive definite. This is always the case. Uh, mu, this is the viscosity coefficient here in the Navier-Stokes equations, is assumed to be a positive bounded function of the density. So the density is in the inter interval rho min to rho max, and then mu maps that into an interval which is between my well, um, mu min and mu max. Zeta is the drag coefficient, which you see in um, the Fokker-Planck equations, a similar assumption is taken there. The Maxwellian is uh, assumed to behave like a distance function to a certain power. This is the case for all uh, Maxwellians that I'm aware of. In particular, this is the case for this Fini Maxwellian that I described to you. Uh, Di is the domain, the stretching domain for the i uh, spring. F of s. This is an important function. And had we thought of this f of s earlier, we would not have spent five years. So f of s is s log s minus 1 plus 1. If you have come across the notion of entropy, this is where it comes from. So let me just draw for you this. Uh, so this s log s minus 1 plus 1 is something like this. So it's a positive function which at 0 is equal to 1, and it's at 1 uh, is equal to 0, and it has superlinear growth, s log s, at infinity. Okay, so what is assumed that the initial probability density function is non-negative, it is assumed that f, this f here, of psi 0 tilde, psi 0 tilde is the renormalized psi 0, so psi 0 is taken up psi 0, you divide by the max value and then z0, you get your psi 0, okay, thus defined, and you make certain assumptions, this has to hold in particular because your psi is a probability density function, so it has to integrate to 1. And it has to be non-negative, because it's a problem with this function. Good. OK, so these are the assumptions. Here's the theorem. So under these assumptions, there exists a triple of functions, density, velocity, and this renormalized probability density function, such that dv is equal to 0. Rho is bounded in time and bounded in space. And it's continuous as a mapping from the time interval into Lp. That's the density. The velocity is in the usual array space for the, uh, for the navier stokes equations, bounded in time, L2 in space, or L2 in time and in the Sobolev space, H10 in space. P here, this P here, is between 1 and infinity, strictly less than infinity. The, the initial density, remember, was between rho min and rho max. We proved that that property persists throughout time. The density remains between rho min and rho max. Psi tilde, this is this renormalized probability density function, is bounded in time and it lies in a Maxwellian weighted L1 space. So this is an L1 space where the Maxwellian is, is in the measure. Uh, it remains non-negative throughout evolution. Furthermore, f of psi tilde, so you remember this s log s 
this function here. When applied to psi tilde, it gives you a bounded function, which is in this uh, Maxwellian weighted L1 space. And there's some kind of strange parabolic smoothing going on, even though you did not assume any Sobolev regularity on the uh, probability density function initially. What is true is that the square root of psi tilde is L2 in time, and it lies in this Maxwellian weighted Sobolev space H1. Such that, sorry, that's the beginning of the sentence, so there exists a function <laughs> such that rho satisfies uh, this equation in the weak sense. So that's what you see here is basically this partial differential equation written in weak form. And the Navier Stokes equation is hold in weak form, so that's the second equation in weak form. And the Fokker Planck equation, very nice, holds in weak form, this one here. So these uh, phi's are just test functions, as well, so let's not get into technical details. So that holds also. Furthermore, there is some kind of energy inequality. So these are energy inequalities satisfying weak solutions, and such an energy inequality holds. Okay. So how the hell did you prove this? Well, okay. So. Earlier efforts, so in particular, let me just flip back to one slide here. This one here, Pierre Louis Lyon Saint Massimo did this paper. What they did was the following. So the whole thing relies on figuring out some kind of energy inequality. Once you have an energy inequality, you're in business. But where does this energy inequality come from? So what they were doing in the case of constant density, so imagine rho is a constant. They did what is normally done for the Navier Stokes equations. You test the Navier Stokes equation with the solution just assuming for a moment that you do have a solution. So that was their first step. The second step was, again, in the case of constant drag, so their Fokker-Planck equation was much simpler, constant drag and so on. They tested the Fokker-Planck equation, and listen to this carefully, tested the Fokker-Planck equation with psi tilde. Now, this testing of the Fokker-Planck equation with psi tilde gives rise to all sorts of trouble. In particular, it gives rise to trouble in this term. It's called the drag term. You, you cannot possibly control this drag term because u is typically a weak solution of the navier stokes equation. Red u is an L2 function, so you don't have good bounds in order to control this term. So what they assumed in order to get the analysis through is that, so this is an additional assumption, that uh, the flow is what they call is corotational. Corotational means that you do not actually have the gradient of u in this equation, but you replace the gradient of u by the skew symmetric part of the gradient in the equation. So basically, you change the equation. So if you change the equation so that instead of the gradient of u, you have the skew symmetric part of the <coughs> gradient in, the, in this equation, when you do this testing that I described to you, you multiply the equation by psi and you integrate because you assume that this guy is skew symmetric here, this term drops out. Because you lost the nasty term. But really, you shouldn't be doing this because what is in the equation is not the skew symmetric part of the gradient, but the gradient itself. So the conclusion is that this testing, multiplying the equation by psi itself, is not the right testing. So if that is the case, then the question is what is the right testing? What should you be multiplying this Fokker Planck equation with in order to get some kind of energy inequality? And the trick is the following you take this f function, you differentiate. Maybe just somebody can tell me what the derivative of this is. Log. Okay. So f dash s is log s. And so the trick is. Instead of multiplying this Fokker-Planck equation by psi itself, you take log psi and you multiply the Fokker-Planck equation with log, log psi. And if you did that, what will happen is that there is an amazing cancellation going on. The following will happen. You take this Fokker-Planck equation, multiply by log psi, you integrate, and you get some rubbish here, which you would not normally be able to control. On the other hand, when you multiply your Navier-Stokes equation with u, this term, this div tau, will also create all sorts of rubbish. But tau is a function of psi. 
So when you multiply this equation by u, you will get some stuff here which will involve u and psi. So one piece of rubbish from the Navier Stokes equation. And there will be another piece of rubbish in the Fokker Planck equation. And if you look at these and you manipulate these terms, what happens, what you will see after a page of calculation, that this piece of rubbish on the right hand side of the Navier Stokes equation is precisely minus of this piece of rubbish that you have in the Fokker Planck equation. So when you add up these two identities that you have, one piece of rubbish and minus what the, that same piece of rubbish cancel each other. And so what you get is this energy identity, formal energy identity. So if you observe this somehow, then you win this. So this is the trick. And so once you have this, then you can build up uh, an argument to show that solutions do really exist, and the idea is to construct an approximating sequence obeying uh, this energy uh, inequality. Once you have an energy inequality, you can get bounds on these approximating sequences. Based on these bounds, you can build up a weak compactness argument. And once you have this weak compactness argument, well, this is when really trouble starts. How to how to because this is a nonlinear set of partial differential equations, weak compactness, weak convergence is usually not enough to pass the limit. You need strong convergence of these sequences, and the question is, how the hell are you going to get strongly convergent sequences? Well, we do know how to do this for the Navier-Stokes equations. There are standard techniques for doing this uh, for Navier-Stokes, but we see this weird testing and these logarithms and some strange stuff for uh, the Fokker-Planck equation. Uh, you encounter some very non-standard spaces here for, for the focal plane equation. And uh, so that is sort of the tedious part, how to get strong convergence for the property density function. So really the most difficult step is to go from weak convergence to strong convergence. So for the Navier-Stokes equations, as I said, this is fairly standard, even in the case of variable densities. In the case of uh, Navier-Stokes focal plane systems, John Barrett and I managed to do this in the case of constant density and constant drag using something called the Dubinsky uh, compactness theorem. This is an extension of uh, Simon's compactness theorem, if you are familiar with, it, with, with this for, 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 uh, for time-dependent problems. Unfortunately, when we started to look at these variable density, variable drag problems, that did not work. So this didn't work, that didn't work, we didn't have any tools uh, to <laughs> to prove strong convergence of, of the sequence of probably density functions. Okay. So what we came up with was the following. So for this variable density, uh, vari variable density, variable viscosity, variable drag uh, uh, systems that you see in front of you here, neither of these techniques, uh, standard techniques, work, so we use the following. So you used entropy estimates. We had to use compensated compactness. This is the difficult <laughs> one, Umura and Tartar. Uh, in some fairly exotic spaces. And so these ordinate spaces come from the fact that you are working with uh, L LP kind type spaces, but they are not really LP spaces because you are working with logarithms. And uh, <coughs> we'll come back to this argument uh, due to phi rise and novelty. So let me just very quickly go through the proof in the steps. So first step is, so the, the idea is to use tricks from numerical analysis to discretize the equations, but only in time. So you take these partial differential equations and discretize in time. So once you have discretized in time, on every time level, you will get a nonlinear set of partial differential equations, but they will be limited because you are stepping in time. So then the next thing you do is on every time level, you show that there is a solution to the set of equations on that time level. You interpolate between the time levels. This will give you a sequence of space-time functions. And then you use your energy inequality to show that the sequence is bounded. So you will have a bounded sequence in some sense. So you will have a bounded sequence, you can extract the convergent subsequence. Except that convergence means weak convergence. So you will extract a weakly convergent subsequence. And then you'd like to show that, in fact, there is strong convergence also, not just weak convergence, so that you can pass to the limit in the nonlinear equations. That's sort of the idea. So, longer technical step one discretize the system with respect to time using a time step. And you need to do this very carefully so that I should sort of describe to you this uh, magic cancellation between the Navier-Stokes and Fokker-Planck equations. You can't just take any crazy discretization. You have to respect this cancellation property between the equations because this is where the energy inequality is coming from. So then, uh, first trouble hits. 
you need to test the equations with the logarithm of psi. But you do not know whether psi is a priori a non-negative function, because you haven't proved anything so far. Furthermore, in this argument, it is also needed that psi is bounded, and you do not know this a priori. So what is done here is to truncate this function log s, cut it above by a parameter so that it becomes a bounded, this guy becomes a bounded function. Ultimately, we'll let this L go to infinity. So we have delta t and this truncation parameter L. So then on every time level, we have a nonlinear elliptic uh, problem, and then we use a fixed point uh, theorem, in this particular case, Schaeffer's fixed point theorem, to show that on every time level, we have a solution. Mm -hmm. So then in this process, actually, we encounter the next problem is the one that I mentioned to you, that log of this probability density function, is. this is not clear that it's well defined because you do not know that this probability density function is uh, non-negative. So are you allowed to take its log? Well, we don't know, so we need to uh, truncate this guy from below now also. So delta is some small parameter. Eventually, this delta will go to zero. So you have the time step, you have the L, the upper truncation, you have the lower truncation. So then you test the equation not really with this uh, f guy or f dash, but this upper lower truncated version of this. Then you get some kind of energy inequality. But the problem is that you have these various parameter parameters uh, hanging around. Nevertheless, you, uh, you show the existence uh, of, of solutions of this uh, uh, trun upper truncated problem once you have passed the limit with delta equal to zero. So this can be done. Now, we would like to pass to the limit with delta t going to zero. This is the time step. But we'd also like to uh, let this upper truncation go to infinity. Uh, so, in order to do this, we need bounds which are independent of these parameters. So then we go through this testing again, but in order to uh, avoid division by zero, we lift this uh, function here slightly up so that we don't divide by zero. So that gives bounds in various norms. Uh, so this norm on the density, this norm on the velocity. We have L infinity norm on the relative entropy. Uh, maybe I should have emphasized what the relative entropy is. Um, the relative entropy is this term here. And this here is what is known uh, in statistical physics as Fisher information, these square root type terms. So we have a bounds of the relative entropy and the L2 norm in time of this Fisher information. Okay, so then concerning uh, the density and the velocity, we use usual tricks. Uh, so this is a version of uh, Simon's compactness theorem. We get bounds in Nikolsky norms uh, on, on the velocity in order to have uh, compactness for the velocity and uh, the density. Then we use uh, uh, so actually for the velocity. For uh, the density, there's an issue because the velocity is not smooth enough. So we need to use this de pagna leons uh, theory of renormalized solutions to pass to the limit in that equation. Okay, and then we come to the Fokker-Planck equation. This is the hardest part. Uh, first of all, the energy inequality, thanks to the superlinear growth of uh, the logarithmic function, in conjunction with uh, delavalle poussins theorem and the danforth petty theorem uh, implies weak convergence. So we have weak convergence of the sequence of probability density functions. How to get strong convergence? So the idea is the following. What we would like to do, because none of these standard tricks works, is to use Vitali's uh, convergence theorem in L1. We do have weak convergence, so if we manage to prove almost everywhere convergence of the sequence of uh, these probability density functions, then weak convergence and almost everywhere convergence would imply strong convergence. The question is how to get almost everywhere convergence. Uh, so there is a result due to Feyerizel and Novotny, it's a, re a recent result, which says the following. Suppose you have weak convergence and you manage to find some kind of convex function so that the convex, convex function evaluated on the sequence also converges weakly, that implies almost everywhere convergence. Okay, so then you go out hunting for a convex function so that you evaluate your sequence on these convex functions and you prove weak convergence. And the idea is to look for, for a um, look for a convex function of the form 1 plus psi, so let's say, suppose you have a sequence of these probability density functions, uh, to the power 1 plus alpha, and you write this as 1 plus psi times 1 plus psi to the alpha. 
So think of the function one plus s to the one plus uh, one plus s to the one plus alpha. That's a strictly convex function. You know that this sequence converges weakly. Therefore, this factor converges weakly. Okay. Suppose you manage to prove that this guy also converges weakly. So could you prove somehow that this product of weakly converging sequences converges weakly? If you could do that, then you have a convex function applied to your sequence which converges weakly. And then according to this theorem, you would get almost everywhere convergence, and then according to Vitali's uh, theorem, you would get strong convergence. Okay, so the question is, you do have weak convergence of this factor, how to prove weak convergence of this factor? Moreover, how to prove weak convergence of the product? In order to prove weak convergence of the product, we would like to use the diff curl lemma, according to which if you have a weakly convergent sequence and the divergence converges weakly, uh, is pre-compact in some negative subclass space more precisely, and you have another sequence whose curl is pre-compact in a negative subclass space, then the product converges weakly. So this is the idea. Okay, the problem is, again, if you don't know, I mean, it's like a roller coaster. It, it, you know, it was like this for several years, up and down. So then you hit the next problem. The difficult lemma you can't just apply uh, in, in this space because of this crazy Maxwellian. It, it, it's, it's an obstruction. The presence of this Maxwellian is obstructing the argument. So the idea here is to retreat into the domain from the boundary, and when you're inside the domain, the Maxwellian is strictly positive away from the boundary. So away from the boundary, the Maxwellian is bounded above and below by a constant, so the measure behaves like a Lebesgue measure, basically. So you go into the domain, uh, so you go into a, a subdomain, and we use function space interpolation uh, given these bound, various bounds that we have in order to get a uniform bound in L1 plus delta in time, L1 plus delta in space, in this space. So then, suppose you take this f of s function, which is 1 plus s to the power 1 plus alpha, you apply the difficult lemma, and this will give you weak convergence of this f function, this one here, this is a strictly convex function, so now you have a weakly convergent uh, sequence, you have a convex function of a weakly convergent sequence which converges weakly, then you apply this phi rise or novelty result inside the domain away from the boundary, and that gives you almost everywhere convergence inside. Then you take a nasty sequence of uh, subdomains as you approach the boundary, and you get almost everywhere convergence on each of these, and then you uh, extract the diagonal sequence, so you get uh, almost everywhere convergence on the whole domain. So that's basically the idea. So that's uh, step 30. So then you apply Vitali's theorem, and then you get strong convergence of the sequence of probability density functions and the ILR thing. You have strong convergence of uh, the density, strong convergence of the velocities, you have finally strong convergence of the probability density function. You pass the limit in the equations <coughs> and so on. We go into the details. The only remaining issue is to show satisfaction of the initial condition in a certain sense so that this is what is done in this final step 70. So that's basically the idea of the proof. It's a nightmare. Good. On a lighter topic, and then I will close. Yes, okay, thank you. So just to relax, I will show you some picture. Uh, okay, so. The interesting thing from the computational point of view is really not so much how to solve the Navier-Stokes equations. There are standard numerical techniques for solving the Navier-Stokes equations. Suppose so it's much more exciting to look at the Fokker-Planck equation. And this high dimensionality of the Fokker-Planck equation is due to the fact, this Kolmogorov theorem, which says basically the following. Suppose you have a set of 100 stochastic differential equations. 100, just, just some random. So let's say you have 100 stochastic differential equations, and what uh, Kolmogorov theorem says is that you will get a single deterministic parabolic equation to solve, instead of your stochastic differential equations, you have a single parabolic equation in 100 dimensions. Or if you have 1,000 stochastic differential equations, you will get a single parabolic equation in 1,000 dimensions. Okay, so the question is, you have some kind of high-dimensional parabolic equation, how to go about solving this? Well, I think uh, people who work in mathematical finance, I don't, but people who work in mathematical finance regularly encounter high dimensional partial differential equations precisely for the same reason. Instead of solving stochastic differential equations, they end up for the same reasons with high dimensional partial differential equations. So in the last five years, there has been really a lot of work done in numerical analysis in developing new algorithms for solving high dimensional partial differential equations. The problem is, if you think about a grid, 
let's say, in 1D with n grid points, okay, you take a regular grid in 2D that will have n square grid points. In 3D, you will have n cube grid points. And in D dimensions, you will have n to the power d grid points. So in 100 dimensions, you will have n to the power 100 grid points. So basically, computational work will grow like an exponential function with the dimension. So standard numerical algorithms which work on such grids will not perform well. This is, this is known. So new algorithms are needed. Uh, let me describe one idea to you in, in a very simple case. And the simple case is what is known in the literature as um, the dumbbell model. It's called the dumbbell model because you have two, two beads, two beads connected with a spring. So it has a shape of a dumbbell. So what will be the dimension of this? Well, you have three coordinates for one bead. You have three coordinates for the other bead. That's uh, six coordinates in total. So you will have six stochastic differential equations to track all six coordinates. And then if you apply this uh, um, theorem due to Kolmogorov, you will have a six-dimensional parabolic equation to solve. So how to solve a six-dimensional parabolic equation? So the idea is, look at the parabolic equation, this focal Planck equation, and observe that it con contains spatial operators like, um, so actually this should be, there's a Q divergence term missing here. So there will be partial derivative, but there will be a partial derivative in time. There's a partial derivative in the Q direction. There's a partial derivative in the X direction. There are partial derivatives in the Q direction. So there's a natural splitting of the equation into, well, there's a time derivative and there's some term containing partial derivatives in the fluid direction in the X variable. And then there are partial derivatives in the Q direction, which act in the D domain. So what would you do, for example, if you were in 2D? So imagine a 2D parabolic equation. So one spatial direction is x, another spatial direction is y. You could do what is known in uh, the finite difference literature as operator splitting or alternating direction method. And the idea there is you have two, two directions, x and y. You do half a time step in the x direction. Then you turn around and you do half a time step in the y direction. Then again, you do half a time step in the x direction. Then you do half a time step in the y direction. Now, given this particular structure of the equation, you could envisage doing something similar. This is now not a 1D uh, spatial operator. and This is not a 1D spatial operator. We are in six dimensions. So there are basically three directions here and three directions there, but you could do the same. So you could split the spatial six-dimensional spatial operator as follows. You do three-dimensional solves in parallel through half a time step, then you turn around and you do three-dimensional solves in the other three coordinate directions through another half a time step. That's the idea. So th these are these uh, various operators. So it's a schematic picture of what is going on. So think about this as your spatial domain. This uh, line here is your fluid domain, maybe 3D, maybe some channel, or a bottle of water. It's a 3D domain. And then you have D, this is your D domain, a three-dimensional ball, which contains these potential uh, director vectors that you might have in the fluid domain. So this is really a 3D domain, this is a 3D domain. And then you take a grid in your flow domain, and you take a grid in this ball, this three-dimensional ball. And what is observed here is that these differential operators are completely independent of each other. So you grid, you uh, slap down a grid in the fluid domain, and you solve in parallel for every grid point partial differential equations in uh, the other direction. Then you turn around, and for every grid point in the D domain, so this is a 3D domain, for every grid point you solve in parallel partial differential equations in the other direction. So the way we did this, and this was done by my, by my PhD student, who's mm -hmm. at Harvard at the moment, used this machine. So it's not a pocket calculator, as you can see. Lone Star, it's a machine in Texas, has this many processors, that much memory, and so on. So, so it's a non-trivial computational task. So these are some 2D calculations of the X component, Y component of the velocity and uh, the pressure. Uh, these are the three components out of the six components of this Kramer's, uh, so this, remember, this tau tensor, these, this, so it's a symmetric tensor, uh, and these are three of its six components. What is more interesting is to look at the 
uh, shapes of uh, this probability density function. And the way you should visualize this, I guess, is probably the simplest is as follows. So think about picking a point. You pick a point in the computational domain, and those pictures that you saw a second ago correspond to a point there, round about there. So what this probability density function is showing you is what is the most likely stretching of the polymer molecule at that point and the direction into in which it wants to stretch. Okay. So you start off with an initial function, which is a bump. This is an initial condition for the probability, uh, for the probability density, for the, for the Planck equation. And then uh, the shape changes as it evolves in time. And it develops these two peaks. And this is some kind of steady state, which means that at that point that you have chosen in the channel, the most likely stretching of the polymer molecule is where the probability density function peaks. And the most likely orientation is, well, it's not a horizontal orientation, but it's slightly tilted from the horizontal. And it's, uh, I guess, reasonable because uh, if you are sitting at that point, the most likely orientation for the flow is because it wants to go around uh, the cylinder is some kind of vector that way. Uh, we also did 3D computations. So this is the uh, number of uh, elements in uh, uh, the flow domain with uh, that many Gaussian grid points. We were solving the Fokker Planck equation in 3D with uh, 1,800 uh, grid points in this D domain. So we were doing in parallel, because you're doing this parallel computations, roughly 52,000 three dimensional solves in parallel. Then you turn around and through another half a times that you do 1,800 three dimensional solves in parallel as you go in time. And these are just the six components of this uh, polymer's uh, tensor. So I guess this is the last slide. We have also looked at uh, the existence and equilibration of uh, global weak solutions. Actually, equilibration, this is convergence to steady state solutions for these equations in the case of constant density, constant viscosity, and constant drag in those two papers. Uh, the only uh, result from the point of view of numerical analysis, which rigorously proves convergence of any numerical method for this set of equations is is this paper with uh, John Barrett and uh, with a student, Leonardo Figueroa. We are looking at uh, the application of greedy algorithms uh, for solving this high dimensional Fokker Planck equation. That's sort of in a rudimentary state still. So, in summary, I think uh, it's, there really is plenty of stuff to do on this equation. It's extremely challenging and very difficult set of partial differential equations. From the numerical analysis point of view, I think we are still very much scratching the surface. There are no good numerical methods for solving such high-dimensional partial 